Thank you. Am I ready to go? <laughs> okay, I guess I am. <laughs> so I, um, first of all, uh, thanks again for uh, assembling at this uh, auditorium uh, to listen to me, which may not be worth it, but still you have no choice. Um, and because you have no choice, I felt free to switch the uh, topic. I was supposed to talk about this tomorrow, but the other one was not at ready, so I had to <laughs> let me try this on uh, you. So that's what I will uh, talk about, um, because it still has some ceremonial value I put on a tie. Um, and I want to talk, start with uh, a few things about which I will not say anything, but that's a good uh, beginning. Um, so this is a picture of a supernova that was obtained by Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, what you are seeing here is um, a massive star at one time, maybe uh, 10 solar masses or something like that, uh, from the main sequence, and it has exhausted its hydrogen and converted everything to helium by fusion. And if it is massive enough, then the helium um, becomes uh, carbon and carbon to oxygen and things like that. So you'll have a core, which is pretty dense. And um, if the core really exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, about which I mentioned uh, very briefly yesterday, then, of course, all the matter gets pulled in. And uh, then you have this implosion that takes place and with a shock wave, and if the shock wave hits the core, then the whole star sort of explodes. And what you're seeing is the result of some such thing. What is left behind is a part of the star, the neutron star. Um, what one would like to be able to say from uh, the kinds of uh, topic that I uh, chose, turbulent mixing, is to explain uh, features of uh, things like this, how far it expands, in fact, um, how the shock wave is formed, and how fast it moves outwards or inwards and things of that sort. In fact, uh, that is one of the bottlenecks in the whole um, um, program that, uh, let's say, tries to predict the uh, behavior of supernovae. Um, another one I will not talk about it's a very good example, the fluid dynamics of the National Ignition Facility, about which you all know. Um, so you have a fuel pellet like that. Uh, that's the human eye, so that gives you the size. And that's typically a mix of deuterium and tritium. And what you want to do is to somehow heat it to a very high temperature so the fuel fuses and then uh, produces uh, limitless energy for all of us to uh, spend. Um, now, the way it is done, as you uh, probably also know, um, is to take this pellet and hit it with a 500 terawatt laser or combination of lasers for a very short time, picoseconds, or a few picoseconds, and then almost literally the same way as the stars exploded, um, are explored, uh, you might have the uh, fusion. So I have here um, a little bit more explanation of how it is done. So the fuel pellet is put into this um, device, and of course then the device is heated with the, with the lasers, and then the ablation of the material on the outer surface just uh, moves outward with such a rapid momentum that you will also have corresponding compression um, uh, of the material um, by Newton's third law, for instance. And then it hits the uh, pellet and it produces um, fusion and the energy associated with that. And uh, these two flows that I mentioned, and a number of others that I would like to be able to explain, consist of a Rayleigh-Taylor instability. For example, when the uh, when the uh, lighter material is accelerating towards the star or the fuel pellet in the second instance, uh, 
you have Rayleigh-Taylor instability. And then when the uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instability, for example, develops some uh, non-axisymmetric um, shapes, then you have Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. All of them are very common in not only in uh, common fluid dynamic circumstances, but certainly astrophysical contests. But there, rotation, magnetic field, density changes are all felt simultaneously. So Chandra studied these problems, uh, also of thermal convection, and many of you here are experts on that, on that topic. And you know how uh, complicated it is. Uh, but what Chandra did was to codify uh, these effects on a grand scale, uh, put many of them together, rotation, magnetic field, uh, magnetic field uh, parallel to the axis of rotation, perpendicular to the axis of rotation, all these uh, combinations possible. And uh, he, in fact, uh, put them all together in this book on hydrodynamic and hydromagnetic stability. Uh, for more discussion of such complex cases, I give you a few references. Um, I wish to be able to talk about them. Um, but I don't uh, have the ability to discuss them all with you. Um, mostly, uh, at least partly because uh, not very much is understood there. I want to talk about turbulent mixing in a uh, more uh, simple way, um, to which these instabilities are precursors in general. And I want to provide not uh, everything that is known about the subject, but a perspective. A perspective uh, means that I selectively use the material I want to select. Um, I try not to be too prejudiced about it. I want to string a story of the field uh, rather than explain very specific uh, things. And even if I bring in specifics, which I will do, it is with the intention that they will help us string this story together um, along. So that's the uh, goal of my uh, talk. As I say, we consider the simplest case of mixing of a passive tracer by an incompressible flow. Now, that would be uh, the simplest case among all the mixing problems you might consider. But presumably, if you understand that pretty well, or at least uh, uh, string the story well, uh, then you might understand in reasonably uh, quantitative terms, but certainly qualitative terms, what might happen in more complex cases. So the kind of circumstance I have in mind is uh, and shown by these three boxes, which Jörg uh, produced at one time. Um, so the left box, uh, left top, is um, uh, this here, is a passive scalar that is put in there. This is a turbulent medium. Everywhere there is turbulence, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. And you put in here a blob of dye, for instance. This dye has a distribution of concentration which goes off like a Gaussian. And actually, it has uh, the picture is taken 0.9 times the Kolmogorov time scale, those of you who know what that is, but a little bit after it was spherically symmetric. It was symmetric. And then, a little bit later, it has now uh, evolved into this state where you have tendrils and sheets and all kinds of things and more complicated there. So eventually you have something like a fractal behavior. And uh, what has happened principally is it has increased the surface area across which mixing of the dye can take place. And so you should be sort of thinking, keeping this at the back of your mind when I talk about things without really giving any context. Uh, this diagram tells you how the spectrum fills up but that's not really that important for my purposes, so I will move on. So, um, everyone knows how to solve this problem. Uh, the problem is very simple. You have the advection diffusion equation, so-called, where theta is the scalar, that is the concentration of the dye that's been put in. And uh, rate of change of that, this is the advection term, that is the velocity uh, which is doing the mixing, so to speak, is advecting the scalar. And here is the diffusivity of the scalar and the uh, Laplacian. So, um, I have put in no source terms here. So, somehow I have boundary conditions uh, 
uh, for this problem. And uh, uh, the boundary conditions are always, uh, almost always linear in terms of theta. And the equation certainly is linear with respect to theta. So uh, what this says is, for any given realization, uh, this is a linear equation. But in fact, you, because this is a stochastic process um, in general, coming from the stochasticity of the velocity, which solves the Navier-Stokes equation in general, you will have nonlinear terms coming uh, from the product of these averaged over, uh, over some suitable um, averaging machinery. Now, that's the problem. So, the is effectively a nonlinear problem. And, uh, of course, you have to solve it when u is uh, obeying the Navier-Stokes. Uh, it has many complications, and one of the complications uh, I would like to explain uh, in a simple way, which Jeremy Beck actually talked about uh, the other day. I don't know if Jeremy is here or not. Oh, there he is. Uh, so, uh, you can write uh, Langevin equation for this Hawker Planck, and that is to say, you solve this by saying that um, the trajectories that carry the um, uh, particles of the scalar follow this Lagrangian motion, but it, ha it is modulated by this uh, random noise, uh, where kappa is the diffusivity, and this chi is simply uh, the uh, vectorial Brownian motion, or the random noise. So basically, you have the particle that is just advected um, by the velocity itself, but it is subject to this noise as well. Now, if you look at it like this, it, it becomes a problem of tracing particles, um, fluid particles in this instance. And what makes the problem really difficult? As I said, Jeremy already went through it, but I want to take some time to explain this in, um, in um, very pragmatic terms. So, uh, the turbulent velocity that you measure, uh, if you look at it at a very fine resolution, that is, let's say, much small, much finer than the Kolmogorov velocity or something like that, it looks smooth. But if you look at it at scales that are uh, bigger than a certain number of Kolmogorov scales, let us say, then it is not smooth anymore. It's not analytic. And what you find is that if you take velocity differences over a small interval of distance, delta u r, as I called it here, r being the separation distance, is the velocity difference across that separation distance. If the, um, if the velocity field were smooth, it would be proportional to r, the separation distance. But in reality, that's what you find. You find, or I will say that's the, the uh, hypothesis in a way. It goes like r to the power h, where h is less than 1. So now, uh, what this implies is that if you measure a quantity like the structure function, um, it will have a, a behavior like this. Uh, never mind, uh, Greg talked about some oscillations possibly in this region. Uh, I don't know whether they exist or not. But basically, it follows a power law for a certain range of r. And of course, for a very small range, it follows the slope that is given by the analytic behavior of uh, velocity. Now, I want to take a minute for the students here to say how from here you go to something like that. This is the, um, uh, let me explain that, and then I will go back again. So you have delta u r going like r to the power h. You start from there. And uh, now, in, in real space, this behavior for any particular value of h um, occupies a certain fractal space. And uh, therefore, the probability density corresponding to that value of h, let's say, goes like r to the power f of h. If it is a fractal, it is like the, think of this like the number of boxes uh, with that particular value of h, which goes like r to the power fractal minus fractal dimension. It is exactly the same sort of thing. So if you want to uh, get the nth moment of the velocity difference, which is what the uh, structure function is, you just take delta u r, raise it to the power n. That is, you get that, uh, r to the power n h. 
and then you multiply it by the probability of its occurrence, integrate it over all h. I couldn't find the integral sign as I was doing it, so that's why you see this complicated mess. So you do that. So this is uh, the integral you want to evaluate. And of course, this r is a small quantity, so this really, most of the value for this integral comes from um, the position where this is a minimum over all possible h's, and call that zeta n, for instance. And then you calculate, therefore, you calculate this integral by the steepest descent method or something like that near this minimal point. And that uh, gives you that the uh, structure function goes like r to the power zeta n, something like that. Now, now let's go back here. So um, if, uh, for, if the turbulence is Kolmogorov turbulence, um, then uh, h is one-third. And uh, for example, the second order structure function will go like um, two-thirds, and third order will go like uh, one, and fourth order will go like four-thirds, etc. Uh, but in practice, this h is not one-third, but has a certain distribution in the space. And that is the origin of this multiscaling of turbulence, and this is the friction parisi uh, way it was expressed. And if in terms of the empirical evidence for such a, such a behavior, there are many papers, but I cite one here which I think has um, uh, some of the more detailed calculations and, and things like that. So what's the point of all this? If delta ur is going like r to the power h, uh, just a simple integration of this will tell you r will go like t to the power 1 over 1 minus h. Therefore, for all h less than 1, this will blow up. This will blow up in t, and the Lagrangian paths, um, that is, two particle paths that have separation of distance r, will separate explosively and are not, in some sense, not unique. And this introduces so many complexities, as you can imagine. So I want to maybe say this a little bit uh, more, explain this a little bit more. So um, if you really believe uh, Richardson's law of diffusion, um, that is, you have uh, two uh, particles nearby, um, r naught separation distance at a time t naught, and then they will uh, separate out like this. And according to Richardson's law, for which there is no real proof, there is only empirical proof, and even that is sometimes somewhat confusing. Um, the mean square separation distance will go like the cube of the uh, time interval, and this is the energy dissipation, and this is the Richardson constant sitting in front. Now, notice uh, one thing, and this formula does not have any r naught in it. That is, r naught could be zero, and still this is valid technically, if you believe that this is the case. Um, R naught may be small, it would still be the same. So in fact, technically, if you believe this, two particles that start exactly at the same location at T naught can separate by a finite distance in any finite time T greater than T naught. Now, this is the non-uniqueness I was talking about. And this uh, uh, Jeremy mentioned yesterday, spontaneous stochasticity, as it is called. I found it first in Bernard's paper, and uh, Gregory Ayank has sort of um, advanced this uh, significantly beyond that point. And uh, you may think that this non-uniqueness violates some kind of uniqueness theorem, but actually, of course, that's not the case, because uh, no uniqueness theorem, as far as I know, exists um, for velocities that are have a rough velocity, there is no, comp no contradiction of any sort. And another thing that notice is that, of course, uh, particle path trajectories uh, diverge in uh, chaotic motion, and they, uh, they uh, diverge uh, exponentially. And here you have R0 sitting in front. So if R0 is really, really, really small, then it takes really, really, really large t for it to be conspicuous. Otherwise, the particle paths are really going uh, with each other for a long time. And so uh, this is a counterexample to the, to the point that the explosion of uh, separation distance in turbulence is a lot more, uh, a lot more 
in, in, uh, in uh, uh, fluid dynamics, turbulence. So the, you will ask, as uh, I uh, uh, ask, well, in reality, um, this, uh, even if you believe Richardson's law of diffusion, it's not valid for all small scales. I mean, it they, is only valid in the inertial range of scale somewhat, and so you have to ask what that cutoff will do for you. Uh, therefore, I have here a qualitative explanation of what might actually happen, and two cases. In both cases, we are concerned about Reynolds number uh, very large, and one case where the Schmidt number, so-called, which is the ratio of the diffusivity of the scalar to the... Um, no, ratio of the diffusivity of the vorticity to the diffusivity of the scalar. This is large diffusivity, which is true of, let's say, something like, uh, like a silicone oil, and this uh, true of some uh, sodium or something like that. Now, um, so it's, it all depends on the relative magnitudes of the velocity field and the scalar field. Now, when the diffusivity is very small, uh, as I have shown here, then the scalar will have a small scale of its own, its own and that, may, um, that will not match with the smallest scale of the velocity field. And here is a comparison. Here is the smallest scale of the scalar, and here is the uh, smallest scale of the uh, velocity field. So in fact, for all practical purposes, any um, a scalar a scale that is, that is um, even of the order eta b or, or larger, will only see rough velocity field because eta is, uh, is the one that marks the, uh, the border between the roughness and the smoothness. Therefore, here, any, almost any, uh, any two particles um, which for the scalar field um, are in the, in the region outside of this eta b, for instance, they always, al always see the velocity field that is rough. And so, according to what I just said, the particles now uh, separate um, um, very fast, and you have this behavior that their uh, separation distance, uh, separation behavior does not depend upon the diffusivity of the scalar, and this is the so-called anomalous behavior. Uh, so, in fact, for the spread of the scalar, Technically, you always need some diffusivity, but uh, that's the molecular diffusivity, but the rate at which it spreads is actually not dependent on the diffusivity at all. Um, and, but in this case, where the Schmidt number is very large, you have a slightly more complicated situation, where the smallest velocity scale I have given here is much larger than the, uh, than the smallest uh, scalar scale. So, for that, what I have to do is, um, if I have two particles separating by anything uh, like that, I have to wait for them to, uh, that separation distance, to evolve into a size of the order eta before I start applying my, my uh, non-uniqueness behavior and things of that sort. And it takes a certain amount of time, and therefore the anomaly begins to hold only after a certain time, which I can actually calculate. Therefore, basically, you will still see the anomalous behavior, but you have to wait for a lot longer. That's the, um, that's the message of the whole thing. And this kind of um, anomalous behavior gives rise to many complications in terms, for example, of uh, numerical simulations. Um, the uh, Professor P.K. Young will talk to us about the resolution effects, both in space and time, and uh, some of that is related to this kind of uh, behavior. But I will not take the time to explain all that now. Um, what I will do now is, in order to gain uh, the perspective that I want to gain, I will start looking at the uh, enormously uh, huge computations that are being done by a number of people, as, uh, some of whom are in the audience, and I will mention later on. So now, uh, you see how the uh, computation power has grown with time, that's something like that, and these are all the uh, various computers. I've used this slide uh, before. Um, and uh, uh, I uh, remember the time around uh, here when I was uh, really doing some computations. 
where there was a floating point operations like that. And you had to punch holes on a tape like this and uh, learn how to do that. Uh, now, of course, the machines are uh, something like that. And of course, new paradigms and new architectures have come into being. And there's massive parallelism now. And this is now a very complicated story. And I can, of course, no longer uh, program any such thing. Uh, for the, um, well, I mean, this is another story, but I will leave that out for now. For the uh, explanations that I want to provide, I will use the direct numerical simulations of Professor Young, Professor Downsys, who worked together for a while. And uh, their uh, simulations, with which I was involved uh, somehow or the other, uh, the Reynolds number varied from 8 to 650. The Schmidt number from 1 over 512 to 1024. So you have a wide range. And uh, also Toshi Goto and Jörg Schumacher, they have used different forcing schemes. And there is a reasonable understanding that, <coughs> that there is a, a conformity from one to the other. So that's the purpose of what I, well, that's the spirit of what I will uh, do. Now, um, these machines are more bigger than 10 pair of flops. Exaflop machine, I don't know when it'll come, but uh, maybe in another few years. And you need uh, something like 20 megawatts of power to maintain that, and so there won't be many, many of them. Um, so, um, so I will ask myself the following question. In, pass in the passive scalar, uh, over time, uh, I know uh, them myself, there are examples of where the behavior seems to be uh, completely uh, outside of the box of universality. You always think small scales are universal, small scales meaning both dissipative and inertial, and uh, uh, there are instances where uh, such properties are actually violated on the face of it. And therefore, the real question is, should we really ignore this, uh, the idea of universality altogether and somehow uh, reinvent the wheels from scratch? That's the purpose of that. So I want to show instances where now the computations are actually capable of testing whether these universal behaviors are true or not. And then I will give you, after that, some instances where there's obvious breakdown of this universality, uh, but why it, of course, does not exactly mean that what you have known before is wrong. And then I would uh, try to say how one understands those anomalous behaviors in some fashion. That's the goal. Um, now, uh, to explain this, uh, I will use various terms, but uh, try not to confuse you with too many, uh, um, too many names. Basically, this is the spectrum of the scalar as a function of the wave number. And if the scalar has a Schmidt number unity, that is, uh, the two diffusivities of the fluid and of the scalar are the same, then it has essentially the same behavior as here in the inertial range where you have a power law, there's a flux of the uh, scalar variance, and then there is this behavior where it drops off relatively fast. If the Schmidt number is very large, then you are in this region. The diffusivity does not come into play until you get your gradients up to very large values, that is the scales get smaller and smaller, and you have this region where viscosity is important, but the diffusivity has not yet become important, and it is uh, the minus one power, and this goes after Bachelor, and Craigman made a very important contribution to that, which I will tell you also. On the other hand, if the scalar has a diffusivity which is on the other end, that is very small diffusivity, you, uh, the scalar uh, diffusivity starts to act well before viscosity starts to act, and it will have a behavior like that, five-thirds here, minus 17-thirds here, and then something like an exponential 
Now, uh, at, at the moment, in fact, we can test all of these, whether it is true or not, but I just want to show you only uh, ideas that were controversial. And one of the controversial things whether, was whether there was this uh, minus one power. And um, uh, again, I use PK's simulations. And what you find is that the spectral density as a function of the wave number, as you increase the Schmidt number, it, uh, as you can see, uh, gets closer and closer to minus one power as you want. Now, this is the theory of Batchelor and Craignan. Both of them have this minus one power, and then there is the exponential or the Gaussian-like falloff for large K in Batchelor's theory, and somewhat more complicated one there. And the, um, it's now pretty clear that um, that, uh, that this form here is not explained by Batchelor, but it is closer, a lot closer to Teichmann. And uh, the difference between the two is simply that Batchelor thought that the straining of the scalar field is done by a steady field of velocity, which is what would be the case in the very small, uh, small uh, scales that is doing the stretching. Whereas Teichmann thought that the, uh, the uh, velocity field would oscillate very rapidly, extremely rapidly. And that's the model that I will have reason to come back to later on. And furthermore, this constant uh, C of B, um, Bachelor's theory says that, but um, the, uh, the actual measurement shows that. That is the only um, remaining anomaly in this. I really don't know that there is uh, anything that uh, uh, requires too much more thinking on this, so far as I can tell. So, uh, well, why don't I skip that one? Uh, another thing which now uh, the data are supposed to, uh, data are able to do is, if you um, look at the diffusivity, um, the turbulent diffusivity, that is, um, uh, you, I imagine you, you actually know, you tie, take the velocity and the uh, scalar concentration, you average them, and then write it as a turbulent diffusivity times the gradient of the uh, mean scalar. Then the turbulent diffusivity as a function of distance in some, some wall flows, it was all over the place, for instance, like this. Um, and of course, part of it is that the flows were all uh, different in some way, but at least I was interested in knowing whether um, if you confine yourself to one type of flow for all conditions, whether you get the same thing or not. And that's what you find, in fact, uh, the, what the simulations tell you. And there is a, a, a graph here, a, a curve here, which I have derived uh, uh, here, but I will not um, take the time to explain. Uh, basically follows the data extremely well, including the numbers. And all I have done is really to take uh, uh, the spectral density of the cross-correlation here, like that, which is reminiscent of what uh, Lumley did uh, some time ago for the effect of the shear, and then you can, you can get the cross-correlation by integrating it between limits, and it gives you this expression, and uh, including this number and, uh, of course, it comes from uh, empirical stuff that is put in there. So that seems uh, pretty, pretty good. So I think my feeling at the moment is that if you look at second-order quantities, like the spectrum or second-order structure functions and things like that, you're close enough to what the people in the past had actually declared as universal. In particular, in the, in the scalar spectrum, minus one spectrum, uh, minus one seems to be uh, real. And then you also know how the spectrum drops off. So you have a pretty good idea of, the, of that kind of stuff. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, you can be overconfident and say, if you applied it to all other kinds of properties, um, uh, you will get the same positive result. And uh, there is obviously, uh, there are several, let's skip that one, but I want to show you this, uh, where um, what is plotted here is a function, as a function of Reynolds number, a quantity called the skewness of the temperature derivative or skewness of the derivative of the scalar. Uh, 
So I have the scalar measured as a function of space or time, whatever you like. And so theta, temperature, as a function of time, in a flow where temperature is fluctuating. I take its derivative. If I take its derivative, I am looking at the small, small scale quantities, because derivatives always give you smaller quantities. And um, if I, um, uh, if I, small scale quantities, according to the theory of universality and things of that sort, must be isotropic, locally isotropic. This is the hypothesis you heard, local isotropy and homogeneity and things like that. So if it is isotropic, it must also be reflectionally symmetric. That is, you take the third order moment of that, d theta dx cube, average it, and that's a third order, which is an odd order quantity. And if you change x to minus x, um, it will change to d theta dx cube with a minus sign. And of course, the two will be equal only if it is zero. So that's the general idea. And so that quantity must be zero if uh, this, the, the backbone of the universality theory, which is the uh, homogeneous, local homogeneity and isotropy were to hold. But what do you find experimentally? You find that it is uh, forgetting about the initial part for low Reynolds numbers and uh, even allowing for the scatter, it is constant in Reynolds number. And it, the origin is here somewhere, so it's, uh, it's not a small quantity. It's of the order unity. It's always uh, like that. Now, new measurement, this was compiled uh, many years ago, but new measurements have confirmed this over and over again. And so, we want to understand where the heck it comes from and what it means and what it doesn't. So, if you take the uh, uh, signal of the temperature, or in this case, it was from a heated jet, what you find is the temperature has this structure. It sort of has a sudden drop, and then it sort of builds up slowly, sudden drop, builds up slowly, etc. Uh, this is the so-called ramp cliff structure. So if you have such a ramp cliff structure, this is time or space, um, depending on what you want to think. I want to take one of these structures, and I want to sort of idealize it. So it's going up like this, and then it is dropping off over a much smaller scale. And I'm going to hypothesize that this scale is of the order of the large scale, as I know empirically from looking at this, and that's the large scale in the flow. And then the drop-off point here is the smallest scale that is possible in the, in the flow, and that is this E to B. And I'm also going to postulate that the drop that might occur in the smallest uh, period of um, smallest interval is the entire temperature range that is possible in the flow. So if in the flow, if uh, it is going, heated flow is going into an ambient, um, which is of certain temperature, and the maximum temperature in the flow is certain uh, value, then the difference between the two is this theta. And then, how do I explain the appearance of this? So let's say I have a large structure in the flow, which is hot somehow, and it is moving about uh, in the flow with a certain characteristic velocity of its own, which is not the local velocity. So if you have a large structure, it has its own velocity of convection, or advection in this case. Um, and then you will have a boundary layer sitting in front of that. The boundary, there's a stagnation region here, and then the, the velocity, um, the flow goes around here, and then it might separate and mix up and things like that. So, in fact, if you measure, take a trace of a temperature or a scalar along here, you will have a very sharp gradient uh, when it is in this region of stagnation. And then, uh, then when this mixes up, it makes create a big wake and things of that sort, then the temperature fluctuates and drops off to uh, some value. And then the whole thing begins again. So if this is the case, then you can actually make a very simple uh, model. Um, you can calculate what this skewness is. I will not uh, take you through all this. So it simply says it's related to the gradient of the velocity, uh, the temperature there, and, uh, and uh, all the other things that uh, uh, you can go with it. So you get the result. 
that the skewness of the temperature derivative is independent of the Reynolds number and uh, um, goes like the uh, minus half power of the, it should, have, it should be minus half, a minus half power of the Schmidt number. And in fact, the measurements that uh, PK's uh, student, uh, Matthew Clay did, um, show uh, something very close to that, actually. So, basically what it means is that you have a flow in which, once in a while, um, even if you are inside the flow, once in a while you are seeing the largest possible excursions. Um, so it is not like the, uh, the, uh, the temperature is grinding down to smaller and smaller differences as time or distance goes by, but really once in a while you have the, um, the entire um, uh, possibility of the temperature jump occurring. And this actually means, if you go back to uh, the exponents that I was talking about, these exponents have to saturate at some, uh, some point, uh, some art of the moment. And that's certainly true of uh, very simple uh, instances. And for passive scalar, the tendency certainly exists, but nobody has really gone off to large enough moments to tell you whether that is true or not. So it is not like that the universality business is uh, totally uh, to be uh, thrown out, but it is to be understood that sometimes there are certain quantities for which these, uh, these uh, occasional excursions are very important. So uh, one, one other thing I want to say is that, you remember I already said if you take the velocity difference squared, it will go like r to the power some exponent. You can do the same for the scalar, let's say call it a zeta 2, and Kolmogorov's theory would give you two-thirds. And if you do it for the fourth order, for instance, then it would be the exponent zeta 4 would be two times that, and be 2n by 3 in general for 2n. And uh, measurements have always shown that this is the case. In general, this is the case. And so what's the anomaly? What's the reason for this anomaly? So this is uh, the, explain the thing that I want to consider. And I said two questions arise, but I omitted a question later on. Oh, maybe I didn't. But uh, OK. This is where the uh, understanding has uh, been advanced by the so-called Craigman model, uh, where this is the same paper that I mentioned earlier, but later on revisited many years later by him in the 1994 paper which is what uh, everybody seems to know, but not the 68 paper. And a lot of the things that I will say very briefly is in a review article by uh, Falkovich and uh, Gavetsky and uh, Vergasola. And basically what it means is that since it is very hard to solve the problem for the Navier-Stokes velocity, I'm going to replace the velocity field by an artificial velocity field. It, of course, is divergence-free. But uh, that velocity is, uh, is not related to Navier-Stokes at all by putting uh, by hand by me um, in such a way that its, um, its correlation function like that has uh, a power law which is in space, which is what you desire or you think you have in, the, in turbulence, but you have a time correlation which is... Um, extremely fast, that is, it's a delta correlated, as they say. So the two velocity, velocity frames at two different instants of time are entirely uncorrelated with each other. So the velocity will oscillate uh, like in, in, any, in any way uh, possible with no correlation to the previous instant of time. Now, um, the the reason uh, uh, Craig, this may look very artificial to all of us, and in fact it does, but the insight that Craigman had, uh, had was that in fact to understand what happens to the scalar, it is the, it's not the time correlation that is important, but it is spatial correlation, the power law behavior that is important, and time could vary in this fashion. If you do that, you can compute the U uh, nabla theta terms um, directly, and then that is the reason uh, for the existence of this model. And it also is forced, in order to keep it stationary, it's forced by 
um, uh, something like that, which is again delta correlated and it is concentrated essentially on large scales because this is a very rapidly decreasing function of R. So uh, this model has been looked at by very carefully by a number of people. And in fact, Uriel Frisch uh, even uh, said that, but let's not mind, mind that too much. Um, and uh, concepts like zero modes and shape geometry came into being. Um, and uh, so let me explain this a little bit. So let's say you want a third order quantity, um, third order correlation. The three points, one point here, one point there, one point there. Uh, the vertices, the points form the vertices of a triangle. So let's say you have one triangle here and one triangle there. Another triangle, the every triangle like that, and you take um, uh, the average over all of them. Maybe this, this is better. Um, so now these triangles will evolve as a function of time. Uh, they will uh, increase in shape. Uh, they might be distorted. They might become equilateral triangles if they were really uh, very far from it, or if they were equilateral, they might be stretched out, whatever. And uh, change shape and size. And as a measure of the size, what we do is let's take the geometric mean of the lens and call it R, let's say. So you start with the initial triangle, and then you evolve it after a certain time. And then, uh, now you have a different R, you rescale it. That is to say, you rescale all your uh, coordinates to uh, bring you back to the same R. But in order to understand how the, uh, the shape has evolved, then you have these two angles, and you have to write down a function that uh, involves these two angles, and you have to know how that function evolves. Now, the insight of this whole work and the Kraikman model is that the three-point statistics are given entirely by those trajectories for which such a function is a constant. So there's a function of these two angles, which tells you what the shape is happening, and r to the power some zeta 3 uh, is, is constant. And in fact, that is what gives you these exponents, because this is how you write down a scaling function, and that's in fact how it is all, all done. So the important qualitative lesson from the work of the Kraken model is that certain type of Lagrangian uh, trajectories uh, or quantities conserved only on the average uh, determine the statistical scaling. And this somehow is related to breaking of symmetry of conservation flux and yields the conservation flux condition. And so the question really, because if there were no um, uh, no conserved flux across scales, you could not write down such a, such a form. And so in order to explain say, zeta 4 and zeta 5 and zeta 6 and zeta 7 all independently, you want to wonder whether there are other statistical conservation laws whose symmetry breaking provides uh, an example, uh, reason for doing that. So this is in fact how the uh, numerical simulations and theory tell you so you have plotted here 2 zeta 2 minus zeta 4. If the uh, normal scaling were true, this would be equal to 0. But here is the number as a function of this parameter gamma, which Bob had in his model, Bob Craignan. So this is one theory for small gamma. This is one theory for gamma equal to 2. And uh, you have these uh, numerical data over all possible. And this is the theory, actually, for so um, now I think it's uh, pretty well understood that you have a theoretical explanation for why you have the anomaly. And what is important is that the velocity field is not anomalous at all. It's uh, really a, uh, has no uh, strange scaling associated with that. In spite of it, you have anomalous scaling on the scalar. So. The, the reason for the anomalous behavior of the scalar is not to be traced to the anomalous behavior of the advection velocity uh, that works with the scalar, but actually it's an independent of that. You might develop a certain imprint of its own. That's an uh, interesting uh, conclusion to come to. And uh, here, by the way, uh, is probability density of the gradient um, uh, of the dissipation. Uh, which is this uh, of the scalar, and uh, this is the this is the um, 
the theory bit, um, for a parameter alpha that has values between two thirds and and one, and uh, and York computed this, and uh, he showed that for one run with lower resolution you'll get that. If you improve the resolution, you get this, which is really going with uh, uh, an intermediate value of alpha quite well. So, for some reason, uh, this compares very well. Uh, the, the computations he made were the, were the real scalar, and for some reason, it seems to work for uh, work for that as well. So, one consequence of these uh, fluctuations, huge fluctuations. Um, from which I have constructed all these objects, is that uh, traditionally one writes like this. Eta, that is the Kolmogorov scale, you, may, you really mean an average value for the entire flow, is given by nu cube, uh, viscosity cube, divided by the average value of the dissipation over the domain raised to the power quarter. And correspondingly for the scalar, uh, you have a Schmidt number of a certain magnitude, it's just the um, the Kolmogorov value divided by this. The time scale uh, for the smallest scalar is given by eta b squared or kappa, something like that. But of course, if you have epsilon, which actually fluctuates a lot, uh, what this means is that the quarter power of the fluctuating epsilon is not the same as the quarter power of the average value of it. Um, so, in fact, you insert local value of epsilon here, you will get a local value of the uh, Kolmogorov scale, correspondingly a local value of the bachelor scale, a local value of the uh, time scale of uh, dissipation. So these are the local values, and since epsilon can really vary enormously in a high Reynolds number flow, uh, you might have, therefore, a highly fluctuating scale, which could sometimes be smaller than uh, the uh, this uh, average value, sometimes much larger than the, um, than the average value. Could be larger because epsilon can be much smaller than the, the multifractal uh, idea is that it could be much smaller than the average value and much larger as well. So, um, or you could alternatively say that uh, you have a Kolmogorov scale corresponding to um, uh, the fact that the velocity difference across it, this is the Reynolds number based on the Kolmogorov scale and the velocity scale across this, is unity. And both of them give you slightly different versions of the thing, but they are, uh, they are effectively the same. For example, here is a simulation of Jörg Schumacher where he traced out um, certain uh, regions where the, uh, the uh, scale the 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 scalar the scale here was much smaller than the the average value, and here is a distribution of those scales. For instance, so in fact it tells you that you can get very small values uh, with a certain low probability, and also certain large values uh, corresponding to um, with the, the appropriate probabilities. Now, um, this is uh, this is what happens. If you take the average value of this, so now just taking the, this distribution and compute the average value, then it is actually 10 times the, uh, the value that you would get if you had taken the average values of energy dissipation in the first place. So in fact, um, this tells you that the effective uh, diffusive time scale uh, is not really the mean value, but 10 times the mean value. And if you take it like that, then actually you will find that it can be related as Reynolds number to the power half by 100. And uh, therefore, um, you need a Reynolds number which is 100 squared times the actual unity Reynolds number in order to find the turbulent behavior. And so this is what may be related to the so-called mixing transition. Now, so this is all about small scales and their uh, universal behavior and the anomalous behavior and things like that. Let me say a little bit about the large scale features, which were also among those that tempted people to think there is no universality of any sort at all. Um, here is the grid turbulence. This was already shown uh, a couple of times. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Narsima showed this, and then Greg Bewley showed this, and maybe others too. This is a bar of uh, grid, a grid of bars here, flow coming from the left, and then you have wakes behind cylinders uh, here, cylinders forming the grid, and then um, stuff coming through, and then they're mixing up, and then you have this homogeneous isotropic kind of field. Now, if you can heat this grid, for instance, or put in front of it another grid uh, whose size, whose mesh size can be varied independent of the mesh size of this grid, you can actually insert uh, temperature fluctuations into the flow at any scale that you desire, whatever its length scale. Uh, so that's the grid. Um, and what should happen is the velocity, uh, the velocity fluctuations beyond a certain point decays like a power law. Uh, yesterday, Greg showed it goes like t to the power 1.2. Uh, this is from our measurements made 25 years ago. Um, now, what happens to the scalar? Uh, will the mean square temperature fluctuations in this region, that too will vary, uh, will decay. Uh, will it go like a power law in the first place? What's that power law? And what does it depend? Um, the, the same, this M0 is the same as M. Um, now, at the time we looked at this, experimental data were uh, completely uh, contradictory with each other. Um, so, for example, if you plot it like this, it looks not so bad. But at the time it was measured, some numbers were as small as 1.1 and some numbers were about 2.2. And so people declared a war against each other, more or less. But a bit later, Paul Durbin uh, came to the rescue, and he, in this paper, he basically showed that the non-uniqueness of this exponent is not that difficult to understand. It is related to the propagation of the trajectories, and he actually did a very good job looking at uh, all the kinds of things I talked about without really using the same terminology. And on this axis is the ratio of the length scale of the velocity to the length scale of the scalar. So in fact, what you have to be aware of is that when you're seeking a universal behavior and so on, you have to be aware that a scalar field has many other features which you have to take into account. And once you take them into account, it does not seem very hard to understand or appreciate what is going on. Now, uh, nobody really has found out whether such a behavior actually can be predicted from the advection diffusion equation. Um, but in order to understand like that, you have to, you need um, certain models. And these models are also important because there is, again, this is one of the features that confused a lot of people for a while. If you measure the probability density of the temperature uh, in, a, in a certain flow, and what is plotted here is the log of the probability as a function of the, this variable, and it's a parabola which says that this quantity is a Gaussian. This is in one flow, but what looked like nominally the same flow, in another lab, in another, another experiment, it gave you a sort of exponential behavior which is true, and if this is indeed the case in different sort of flows, what's the, what is the uh, meaning about seeking some kind of um, universal behavior? But the truth is that these, um, these things did correspond to different conditions, and uh, the conditions corresponded to the ratio of the length scales here and the ratio of the length scales here. And again, as I said, there is no real understanding of it from the equations of motions themselves, but there are models of the sort that uh, Maida and his colleagues derived some years ago, closely connected with, uh, with uh, these studies earlier. And uh, they, in fact, show that the behavior of the probability density does depend upon the length scale ratio. This is for length scale ratio. Um, greater than unity if you take the ratio of that to that, and here the correspondingly opposite case. So these model studies, what they have done in general is that they assume, as uh, Craigman did uh, just now, we talked about it, assume some artificial velocity 
that satisfies the divergence condition, and then uh, answer all kinds of questions about the scalar. Some, some conditions uh, put on this artificial velocity are more realistic than the others, but the advantage here is you can vary all kinds of parameters as you desire, and then come up with the um, with a qualitative understanding. So uh, this is all summarized some years ago in uh, this uh, uh, paper, but I have a few other references that follow. And basically, I am going to give you a very broad brush summary of the results. If the velocity field were periodic and deterministic, uh, uh, then the whole problem is solved. The problem is um, this homogenization is possible, as they call it technically, which means that this quantity can be written as a gradient of a, of a effective diffusivity times the gradient of the scalar. And that's the problem of turbulence in a way, you know, right? It express essentially the, um, the nonlinear term as a diffusive term. And this uh, goes after the names of Varadhan, Papa Nikolaou, Maida, and others. Now, um, another case where the velocity is a homogeneous random field, but there's a scale separation between the scalar and the, and the, um, and the um, velocity. That is, you inject the scalar at a certain scale that is much smaller than the scale of the, of the velocity field. In this case, too, homogenization is possible, and you basically have the problem solved. And a third case is where the velocity field is a random field, but delta correlated to time, which is the one that I just talked about, the Craigman model, and the AD diffusivity can be computed. So um, the ratio of the scales is immaterial, and you can basically do the problem as has been done. So that gives you certain insight on its own. And then there are other special cases where the velocity is a little bit more realistic, that it's a shearing velocity. It may even have a drift in the transverse direction. And um, this is, uh, you can solve this um, for a special case of the shearing velocity. Again, get a diffusivity, anomalous diffusion, etc. And I've given you all the references here. So, uh, in, in other words, there are behaviors in a scalar that used to alarm someone like me. Well, is this a waste of time thinking about their behavior in terms of something? What is the framework in order to understand all this? It looks to me like you can bring a number of perspectives or a number of points of view uh, into the problem and try to explain uh, all of them, uh, or most of them, as, I, as far as I can see, um, uh, nearly all of them. And so my perspective is essentially that we may not be able to explain everything and certainly may not be able to uh, give you a theory for everything. Um, we have reached a state at which we can string a plausible story of the scalar. If you ask me qualitatively, can you explain, uh, at least I think I can, I can answer that. Um, but of course, if I come up with the first question I cannot answer, then I will have to say I have to go back to the drawing board. It may be that's, that's what will happen. But basically, that is the perspective with which um, I uh, tried to uh, give you the story of the passive scalar. And uh, if you understand that, um, perhaps it is possible to um, put this intuition into other more complicated problems. So I'm uh, basically done. Uh, I just uh, want to thank all of you again for being here and for the center and uh, giving me this opportunity one more time. And then to um, the organizers, Rama and Sravan, um, or I have here my credits like yesterday. But these are all the papers I tried to extract the, um, the information that I presented to you. Uh, I'm afraid there are lots of papers, um, all of which I have uh, read at one time or another, I must tell you that. Um, so you can see my name appearing um, sometimes. Uh, so I uh, worked on this problem for many years now, so I have a reasonable um, idea uh, of where we are. And I hope it is not a delusion on my part. Thank you very much.
She said, uh, thank you for my interesting talk, so okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so she also uh, says, um, I imagine that you can ask me one or two questions. <laughs> yeah, so on. Yes, that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. So in this case, the renormalization group doesn't work? Uh, there are certain uh, conditions for which it works, and that is uh, the scale ratio and things like that. But um, the problem he thought would not work is the one that, um, that his colleague in Princeton was using. Thanks, Srini. Uh, about the Krishnan model, uh, it's usually used for the temperature increments and the moments uh, to try to calculate those scaling exponents analytically. I'm wondering, has it been applied to understand something about the intermittency structure of the scalar dissipation field? Yeah, now, it's somewhat difficult to define the Schmidt number here. The dissipation field really depends upon that. So you can artificially, uh, as in fact several people have done, define a, 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 a diffusivity and uh, work it out. Uh, in particular, uh, Wayne and e at Princeton has done something uh, like that. But mostly people have focused on the inertial range. And of course, the, this uh, calculus, calculation for the probability density of the gradient um, it doesn't have any Schmidt number in it you can compute, but in general you want to get the Schmidt number, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a very useful survey of an enormous amount of work. Now, <clears throat> I see that as you use the word even now, there are artificial models and cases that are considered. Yeah. And you can get a wide variety of results depending on these models. Would you at the end say that, um, or, uh, let me ask it uh, in a different way. Out of all of that work, would you say that now the number of possibilities is limited? Or the behavior can be even wider than what has been considered till now? So the way I see it is, um, when I uh, started looking into it uh, many years ago, um, there were observations that are scattered, uh, and they seemed not to fit into any uh, pattern, and uh, there was no real explanation for some features that seemed anomalous or strange. And now, um, with accumulated knowledge, at least you can say, okay, um, this is really, uh, maybe this is how it is. Um, but, uh, you know, it is uh, like, um, it's a metaphor, um, but it may not be the real explanation. So, you, so it's, as in terms of building qualitative understanding, uh, maybe we have advanced a lot. That's what I would say. Any question? The scalar mixing that you are talking about, like, uh, does it depend on how you start off with the conditions? Like yeah. you start off with a, a, stable stra a stably stratified or an unstably stratified flow, and does those uh, exponents show some variations with that conditions? Yeah, I don't really know about uh, stratification and things of that sort. I mean, I don't know meaning. I don't know whether any of the explanations that uh, came through today will help you understand those. Um, but even in the simplest case of a passive scalar with no stratification effects and things of that sort, what I am saying is there are certain parameters that you might not have thought are important, like the ratio of the length scales, um, for example. Um, and those are important in how the scalar behaves. And there are certain aspects of the scalar that evolve independent of the velocity field, although it's a advection uh, 
of the scalar that actually creates the dynamics of the scalar. So you have to know these, um, these special features and be able to take into account in order to have a qualitative understanding of how the scalar field behaves. So if you have stratification, surely uh, much of this may have to be modified. Um, as I started in the very beginning, uh, you know, you might think that some of these ideas may be uh, helpful, but I'm not sure. Uh, and it depends upon the kind of thing, kind of uh, property you, you ask. Um, essentially what I'm saying is, if you solve the problem exactly in some sense, that is to say you have solutions for the advection diffusion equation, and from there you can calculate all the things, I don't have to give you many excuses. I don't have to tell you, well, you have to be aware of the ratio of the length scales, you have to be aware of this, you have to be aware of that. Short of that, we don't have this ability to do that. Therefore, I'm giving you the next best scenario that exists today, which is that what seemed like many uh, strange properties seem to be explainable by um, wringing your hand a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit. So you have some understanding of the ideas of, the, of how uh, these behaviors come about. That's the advance that has happened so far. Whether that advance is, uh, and surely that is not enough, and that's not how science has progressed. You have to be more certain. But in a problem like this, uh, which is very uh, complex, uh, uh, not only the scalar, what I say applies to turbulence in general, where it's a very complicated behavior, you sort of build up your intuition by uh, working on various number of problems and trying to understand where special circumstances can be explained and how they can be explained. So that's the only way, it seems to me, short of being able to come up with a, with a, a full solution. And I don't really know that it will actually happen any time. Uh, that's how I, I perceive it, yeah. So suppose you wrote down the Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah. With an equation for the passive scalar. Yeah. With a certain diffusivity. Yes. Can you always reproduce what you observe? Can I what? Reproduce what you observe. Ah. Uh, that's a Can good you put question. you in the same conditions as in the observation or the experiment? Um, in in uh, these four equations. Yeah, if the boundary conditions are the same. Uh, yeah, so far it seems like that. Same. Yeah. Um, um, what, however, I cannot say is that uh, simulations is another story. Um, you have to constrain your simulations a lot in terms of the current number, in terms of um, spatial resolution, much more than one had thought was necessary in the past in order to get uh, an answer that can be reproduced. But you don't have to introduce a new parameter, that's what I mean. Yeah, uh, as far as I know, I, I mean, I really, why would you ask that? I mean, what is the new parameter? No, yeah, no I, I don't have any. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm just wondering whether that, yeah. sort, that sort of thing was necessary, um, because there are different models for the, um, there seem to be widely different models for explaining uh, the different phenomena which you saw with... Uh, no, each model like, explains some particular thing. It's yeah. not like uh, they all explain the same thing or uh, they explain different things. But if you want to understand, for example, why the probability density is Gaussian as opposed to exponential, and uh, one model tells you, well, the reason may be that in fact the range of scale, the ratio of the scales is not um, unity, but it is of some a uh, large, uh, large number or small number, and the experiments seem to confirm that. I mean, that is all one can say. So I no longer need to wonder whether, well, okay, this is how I think. I no longer need to wonder. I don't know, maybe sometimes I get Gaussian, sometimes I get exponential, and I don't know why, but now I can say, okay, I think it is the length scale ratio effect. It's a soft uh, understanding. But, but that's the best uh, so far one can do. So I'm certainly not overselling the understanding. Um, you can get somewhere. Yeah. 
Uh, Sveni, you have mentioned the relevance and importance of these sudden temperature changes called cliffs and so yeah. on. So is underlying physics known? I mean, why they appear in the flow and what's the underlying physics? Um, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, um, yeah, I can say something, um, but I don't know what is, uh, whether it is a real good explanation or not. So, um, if you look at, um, say, uh, increments of velocity, for instance, or temperature, as you know, you, you have a range of possibilities, but one possibility is that it's independent of R. So, that you will have an, a most, uh, the minimum value that tells you it must be like that. So, delta V U will be just the maximum possible thing, the maximum possible uh, difference that you can see in a flow. That is some technical thing. But on the other hand, what I'm, if it is in a jet, for instance, which is where that was taken, so the way it would be, you have a heated jet, so you have heated flow coming into the laboratory, and you would think that the, it would engulf flow from outside and becomes mixed up, and, and as you go along, you will see this mixed uh, flow but it is entirely possible that you haven't mixed everything. And even if you're sitting there, you will see the flow that actually came from here, not having mixed all its way through. And that's what it actually implies. Once in a while that happens, and it happens no matter how far you are, it just changes the probability of finding it. And so we in fact sat down and measured that probability and you know, you have to wait many, many days like Greg did uh, in order to make sure your statistics are right, but it is certainly the case that uh, something like that happens. And as a result of that, uh, you have uh, different types of behavior of the probability density of the scalar on uh, one side of the, uh, uh, the mean value and on the other side of the mean value. So that seems to be the ex physical, as physical as I can get. Any more questions? Okay, then let's thanks, Professor yeah. Srinivasan. Thank you.